God, thank you that we can sing your praise. Thank you that the strife will not be long, God. And I pray uh, today will be the day when we shout the victory on high. God, help us as we look at your word. And God, uh, we have a little bit of church business to do. And God, we're going to uh, God uh, petition you with our prayers. Help us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm in Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Now, uh, Proverbs is all about wisdom. And here we have in chapter 9 a picture of wisdom as a, a woman who runs a, a house. Uh, maybe it's a restaurant, if I put it in modern terms. Um, maybe it's a, what they, they used to call an inn. Um, back in colonial days and in jolly old England, they had places called inns, and when you were hungry, you could go there. You could sit down like a restaurant and get some food. Uh, but they had rooms to rent, upstairs or in the back or whatever. And so you could rent a room, and they would feed you, and you could sleep there. And, and uh, so maybe, maybe it's like an inn, uh, or maybe it's a place where people come to eat. But, but it says there in verse number 1, uh, Proverbs chapter 9, Wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest place of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding... She saith unto him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of understanding. Heavenly Father, help us now as we study about the maidens of wisdom that try to get us in the right place where we can learn something. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, that word maiden has a lot of definitions. Um, 
it can mean an unmarried uh, woman. Um, and back in the good old days, that meant a lot more than it does now. Uh, but usually someone's young a female daughter that's not married. Um, and, and these daughters, they would help out with the family. Let's say someone came a call into your tent out, out in the uh, you know, she uh, shepherd land with the sheep and everything. And so it was your job as a host to uh, uh, feed them and put them up for the night and be hospitable. And uh, your your daughters would be uh, the cooks and the maitre d's and the, the people that looked after uh, your guests. Um, remember the Bible, Abraham had to visit from three gentlemen. Uh, he had no daughters uh and uh, so his servants, uh, probably his slaves, uh, they helped Sarah out. Um, the picture in Proverbs uh, uh, right here is, is rather unusual. But in modern day times, uh, it's easy to understand. Now, um, used to, especially in the cities, uh, they would have uh, what we would call diners. And uh, they didn't have television. And most diners were mom and pop affairs. So you couldn't go exactly uh, afford a radio commercial. So what you would do is you would uh, get somebody uh, to make you a sign. And uh, you would get this fella, uh, you know, out here. Um, and he would... Uh, what he would do is he would kind of walk around like this. And he had what they used to call a sandwich sign because there was a sign up on the front and a sign in the back. And, well, know, his neck's not that long. And, you know, put a hat on him of some sort, you know. And, um, dirty. Yeah. And... Uh, maybe you would say, you know, uh, eat at Joe's. And then probably have an address or something. So you, you, and he would walk up down the restaurant, maybe down the street a little bit, and, and, and he would get people uh, uh, enticed to go eat at the restaurant. And that was a form of advertising. Well, here is something similar. The, the woman who has built the house here, the, the wisdom, her personification, she's out there calling the people in to come and eat uh, that, uh, the, the feast of wisdom. And so uh, her maidens are helping her. Maybe they're passing out coupons or menus or uh, different things. Um, but they, these maidens say several things to people. And we're going to look at that tonight. First of all, a, a maiden of wisdom uh, uh, is going to uh, give you a warning to turn around, to turn, to turn. You know, everything in the Bible is not all positive. Matter of fact, there's a lot of negativity in the Bible. And one of the things that people don't like to be told is they need to turn their life around to something different because they're going the wrong way. But you know, if you're going down the street and all the traffic is coming the other way, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, it's best for you to turn turn the other way. Uh, it's based on several things. Verse number 10 there in Proverbs 9 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So this is based on the fear of God. They're talking to people. Hopefully they'll find somebody that fears God. Look, if you don't fear God, you need to go to some place that God has made and see the, the power of nature and understand that that's just a tiny little thing that God just did. Just, just kind of one day he thought it and there it was. Uh, up in New England... Uh, there's a, there's a place up there, uh, and it's a great big high falls. And they've got this, they've got this trestle that goes across this little, uh, it's not a little, but it's quite a deep. And, and it goes sort of right over the falls. So you go over this, you walk over this bridge, and you can look down, and, and you can just, 
just hear the water. It's a roar. And then at the bottom, it just kind of churns up and it becomes almost like smoke. And that's a little falls. This is not Niagara. This is some little place up in uh, New Hampshire, I believe it was. And uh, you see many things like that in nature. And you think, God made all that. And his power is infinite compared to this stuff. Um and look, God can do anything he wants to with nature. I mean, look at Lake Tahoe. At one time, Lake Tahoe was a big deal. They, they were making lots of electricity with Lake Tahoe. People would go there on vacation. Now, now it's dried up almost. Lake Mean, Lake Tahoe, it, it's just terrible. To look at pictures, you go, like, you got to be kidding me. Uh and the worst thing about it is they can find all these dead bodies that people have bumped off and thrown, thrown into the lake. Uh, I guess the mobsters in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, Acts 14, uh, Paul is talking uh, to some people and, and saying, Sirs, uh, why do ye these things? Uh, Paul has done some miracles among them and... and uh, they think he's a god, so they've come with offerings, and they're going to sacrifice offerings to Paul and his companion. And he says, we also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without a witness... And that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So, so the, the maids of wisdom are saying, look, if you fear God, remember who God is. God is the one that feeds your face and takes care of your family and, 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 and you know, uh, make sure your dog don't get run over in the road and, 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 uh, make, make sure when, when your kids get sick, they get better and, uh, you know, uh, remember who God is, fear him. And it's, it's called repentance, folks. Repentance. What is repentance? Well, Malachi, Malachi chapter 2. Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, wrong, wrong verse. Uh, Acts chapter 26, rather. Acts chapter 26, 19 and 20. Uh, Paul is talking to King Agrippa. Um and he says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So he kind of gave uh, Agrippa his testimony. And uh, he's laying there on the ground telling, uh, you know, Agrippa that he, you know, God knocked him down. And he said this bright light. Um, and, he, and he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. God gave me a mission. Uh, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea. And then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Notice that works and repentance are two different things. So what is repentance? Well, repentance is where you don't like yourself. You, you, you realize that you, not what you're doing, but you, yourself, has a problem with God. And you and God have to work this out. That's repentance. That's all repentance is. A lot of people try to make it into this big long thing where you have to change your whole life. You don't. You just have to look at your life and say, Yep, I'm a sinner and I'm worthy of death, worthy of hell, and I agree with God. That's repentance. Then you're a candidate for all kinds of things. And also, sometimes these maidens have to, have to take people and rebuke them to get them to turn around. He said, rebuke them. Yeah, rebuke them. Rebuke them. He said there in Proverbs 9, Forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner giveth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man giveth himself a blot. <laughs> yeah. You, you talk to some people, and they just don't like what you've got to sell. Uh, even if you go totally positive, They'll still take it negatively. I've had them do it. Um, uh, I had one fellow, one time we was in, standing in front of his trailer, being John Burdett, and uh, his wife came to the door and 
All we did was hand her a track and say, here, we're from the Open Door Baptist Church. We'd like you to have this gospel track. And from inside, we heard this guy going, get out of here, blank, 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 blank. I mean, he charged the door. He grabbed his wife, slung her inside, slammed the door. And then he opened the door again and said, you come back, I'm going to shoot you. And slammed the door again. I mean, real sweet guy. Uh, he didn't even know what we had to say. Uh, but just being there was a rebuke to him. Um, I felt like that really needs the Lord. Malachi 2, verses 6 and 7. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. Talking about Christ. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. In the Old Testament, the priest was supposed to be the messenger of the Lord. And the New Testament is supposed to be the preacher. The pastors of the churches and the missionaries and the evangelists. Revelation 3.19, uh, God told the church at Laodicea, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent, repent. Um... There's a saying, maybe you've seen this on a bumper sticker. It says, God allows U-turns. You know, there's lots of turns you can make in a car. You can come up to an intersection, you know, and you can put your little blankie on and you can go right, you know, around the sidewalk and the little green strip there. And you, you can go left. That's kind of a regular right and left turn. And uh, then when you get on uh, like I-10 out here or, or uh, 110, uh, you have a, a, a kind of a, a graduated uh, uh, merging into traffic. Well, technically that's a turn because you're turning off the road that you're on, turning on to another road. Sometimes you go up north and you find all these loop-de-loop-de-loop cloverleaf kind of things. Then you can make what they call a hairpin turn. Now, I don't think we have any real hairpin turns around here. Well, up home we did. We had several of them on the way to school that were just rather dangerous. And, of course, us dumb teenage kids would bet each other how fast we'd go around the dead man's curve. Uh, um, I usually slowed down and I made it. I didn't win no prizes, though. Of course, then, then they have what we call the U-turn. You go on the wrong way and, and, and you, then you just make a little U and you, you go the other way. Uh, of course, some people uh, make what they call a three-point turn. This is where you don't actually have enough room to kind of turn the car in one swell swoop. You have to you have to go doing, doing, doing and, and, and kind of get out that way. Uh, sometimes it's more like the 17-point turn. <laughs> we, uh, I've had some of those. Uh, does everybody know what a J-turn is? Do you know what a J-turn is, Brother Clay? All right. Well, that was made famous by an actor uh, called uh, um, Jim Garner, um, yeah, James Garner, yeah. And he was in a show called The Rockford Files about a detective. And about every other show, he would take that little trans of his and he would whip that thing around <laughs> and go the other direction. That's called a J-turn. And uh, it has to do with throwing the, throwing the car in reverse just at the right time. to got to whip it around. Uh, it's probably terrible for the car. <laughs> and, and I guarantee you James Garner wasn't driving it when they did that. Some stunt, stunt driver. There's another one that's similar to that. It's called the handbrake turn or the bootlegger's turn. And uh, this is where they hit the hit the handbrake while stepping on the gas. And somehow they, 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 they whipped the car sideways. That's called drifting. Um, I don't recommend you do any of those. I like the one where you pull up to the corner and you turn 90 degrees. And that's the kind of turn I like, okay? Uh, and I've made some U-turns. God, God does allow U-turns, by the way. Then uh, these maidens, um, after they've given a lesson on the turning, the warning to turn, they, they have an invitation to come feast. Now, that would be pretty good. Uh, that would be an incentive for people to uh, uh, probably to speed if the cop gave you a ticket and then gave you a coupon to go eat. Now, that would be something. Uh, but they don't do that. Um, 
these, these maidens are trying to get people to come in. Uh, and wisdom is trying to get people to uh, come and feast of the wisdom. Uh, God is cooking up wisdom all the time. Now, there's all kinds of wisdom. There's, there's evil wisdom. And, and this is good wisdom. This is connected with the scripture, okay? Um, 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. So Paul says, look, I've taught you some things, Timothy, and you, you keep doing them. You, you don't forget them. You go, look, if you need to go back and review a little bit, do that, but don't forget what I've taught you. I don't know if you realize how many things people that have sat here Sunday after Sunday have learned in this church. A whole pile of things. Don't forget the stuff. Don't forget the stuff. You say, well, why do preachers repeat themselves? Well, so people don't forget the important things. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God's cooking up this batch of wisdom stew. Good stuff. He wants you to come and partake of it. There's a call to come and dine. We like to sing that song, come and dine, the master call, come and dine. That's from John 21. Um, Simon Peter and the disciples, after, after the resurrections happened, they, they've decided to go fishing. And so they've gone uh, up there to the place where they used to fish. And uh, one of them sees somebody on the shore. And he's got him a fire behind him and what looks like some food cooking. And he's waving at him and saying, hey, come on in here. And, and John recognizes who it is. It's the Lord. Uh, you know what Peter did? He, uh, the Bible says he was naked. He threw on his coat and jumped in the sea. He had some unfinished business with the Lord. Uh, he's the one that needed the spiritual food the worst. And, and that's what pains me as pastor. The people that really need the preaching and need the teaching more than anybody else are usually the ones that aren't here. It's a shame. It's a shame. You see, the caller has to make a sacrifice. Uh, the call to come and dine by Jesus... Uh, of course, Jesus, you know, he was God. He could do it. But if it was just a man, you would have to take some of your food and give it to someone else that you call him. Uh, that's what we call sharing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Taking, and sometimes we have to take our experiences and our spirituality and we have to help somebody out. We have to give a little bit of ourselves to somebody else. That's the way the church grows. People want to see some real Christianity. Ah, uh, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This sacrifice is a part of the Christian life. We've got to sacrifice for him. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 2, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Um, in the Middle Ages, they had these uh, royal banquets that the, the dukes and the, the princes and the kings would have for all their, their retinue. And, and they, they, it was part banquet, part Hollywood, because they would put on a show. Everybody's heard uh, of uh, Sing a Song of Sixpence, probably. Uh, that's about... Uh, some blackbirds that are baked in a pie. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? The king was in his counting house, counting out his money. 
The queen was in the parlor eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden hanging out the clothes when down came a blackbird and pecked off her nose. <laughs> there was a, such a commotion that little Jenny Wren flew down into the garden and put it back again. <laughs> There's several other versions of it. Um, so what's that poem about? It's interesting that you should ask. Many scholars think that Sing a Song of Sixpence is actually about the printing of the King James Bible. The original printing in 1611. So how can that be? Well, Sing a Song of Sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds. Blackbirds was a nickname for black letters on a page. And back in 1611, there was only 24 letters in the alphabet, not 26. I don't know. But they taught that to the kids. Strangest thing about those little things. But actually, the people did try to do this. Uh, in 1549, there's an Italian cookbook uh, for a recipe called Live Bird Pie. I don't think I'd want to eat that. Uh, and again, in 1725, in a cookbook by a guy named John Knott, uh, how to make a pie and put some live birds in it to come flying out. So, uh, it's called, How to Give Your Guest a Heart Attack When You Invite Him for Supper. Oh, do you serve this at dessert or when do you serve this? I don't know, like a pot pie? But look, God don't pull no surprises on people. His is what's advertised. You come to God, you get wisdom. So, you're warned to turn, you're uh, invited to feast. And all this is an aid of doing one thing, directing your life. See, God wants to tell you how to live. Some people don't like that. Oh, I don't want anybody telling me how to live. Really? Well, some people I would say to them, I don't think anybody in this room, but I've met some people that have told me that. And usually those people I want to say, really, you haven't done such a good job with it yourself. How about giving God a crack? It's true. People can make the biggest mess of their lives you've ever seen. They really can. Um, in order to get God's direction in your life, you have to have a desire uh, for God's smarts. And that desire has to be revived in you. Um, if you just go on around observing uh, and uh, absorbing, observing and absorbing what the world has to give you, you're not going to get very much. You're going to get some burnt toast and uh, some scraps on a bone. Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, Though des through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh, and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Uh, most young men and women, they go out now from the house, and, and or at least in my generation, uh, there was a generation there for a while that you know, stayed at home, lived at home. Uh, I don't know, I, has that passed, or are people still doing that? I, don't, I just really don't know. But when I was coming up, the idea is when you got to be 18, you graduated from high school, you left home and you found your own life. You had a profession or you had something you did and you went to college to get more education and then, then, you, then you started your own family. And that's the way it's been for thousands and thousands of years. And that's what it says here in Proverbs. It's a natural thing for you as a young person to want to go out and, and, and find out what's out there. To get some wisdom. To get some smarts. Colossians 1.9 says for this cause we also since the day we heard of it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul said, look, we came, we preached to you and we heard that you became Christians and you built this church and we pray for you all the time that God will help you and give you wisdom. I pray, I pray that for you all all the time. Uh, life is hard sometimes. And even when life is easy, you need the wisdom of God. Uh, 
sometimes when it's easy and good, it's more dangerous than when it's bad. Because usually when things are bad, people will turn to God automatically that's Christians. But when things is good, God, God who? Yeah, that's what they do. Then God has to drop a little bomb on them to get their attention. Then all of a sudden, they want to talk to God real bad. Uh, to get direction in your life, you're going to have to have some instruction and teaching. That's why church is so important. Proverbs 4.13 Take fast hold. It's just not take hold. It's take fast hold. Now it's grab this and don't let it go. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her. For she is thy life. Keep her for she is thy life. I, I don't know how you are, but I, I have little places where I put my goodies. I have a, people laugh at me, they come into my office and over to the right hand side of my desk, there's a little popsicle box made of popsicle sticks that I made. I painted it red. So what's it for? I stick my wallet and my keys and all that junk in the popsicle box and, and it's, just, it's just to hold everyday things. But there's a couple boxes in my office, you better not get your mitts on, those are my goodie boxes. They're my goodie boxes. I keep my goodies in there. Special little things. My special little knife. And my special little tie tag. That's my only little tie tag, but that's beside the point. And, and my good pins. And, and little stuff. Uh, I've got this adorable little uh, ruler, the architect ruler. It's about that long. It's made of aluminum. Uh, I found that one day somewhere. You say, why is that precious to you? Because I used the big version of it for years and years and years and years. And it's just it's just some little trinket that's mine and is my little thing. And I have little drawers full of little little goodies. And I put them away. They're my little goodies. And, 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 and nobody gets into my goodies. I slap their hand, they get in my goodies. Well, that's what God's telling you. Get, get a hold of his wisdom and... and Keep it, this stuff, and put it in your little goodie box. Keep it. You're going to need it. Sure enough, uh, some little thing you may get may come in handy. I've had several kinds of things like this. I found one the other day that I, I liked. Um, I was waiting on my car to get fixed. Had some tires put on. And it's one of these little knives that, you know, uh, it's got little scissors in there, and uh, but this is the handiest. It's lighter than all of them I've had, and the things come out of there easier. And it's got a little clip. You can clip it on your belt, you know. It's just a little goodie. Uh, you say, well, well, do you really need it? Well, not right now, but I, I guarantee you somewhere if I carry this around long, I'm gonna need it. Right, Vic? Sometimes you need this junk. Now, how do you make your life go the way it's supposed to go? Wisdom in and of itself is like the car. Uh, instruction and teaching is like the gasoline that you put in the tank and the oil that you put in the engine. The key is what you need to start the car. Because you're not going to go anywhere until you start the car. And the key to all this is understanding. God needs to give you some understanding. Verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is the understanding. You need to understand some holy things in your life. Proverbs 16, verse 20, He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whosoever trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. The wise in heart shall be called prudent. And the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. It's the key. It starts the car. But the instruction of fools is folly. Someone said this, A man may know all about rocks, and his heart remain as hard as they are. A man may know all about the winds, and be a sport of passions as fierce as they are. 
A man may know all about the stars and his fate be the meteor that after a brief and brilliant clear is quenched in the eternal night. A man may know all about the sea and his soul resemble the troubled waters which cannot rest. A man may know about how to rule the spirits of the elements, yet not know how to rule his own. A man may know how to turn aside uh, a flashing thunderbolt, but not the wrath of God from his own guilty heart. He may know all that Shakespeare knew, all that Einstein knew, all that all the great geniuses have ever known. He may know all the mysteries and knowledge of the universe, but if he does not know his Bible, what good will it bring him? In conclusion, the maidens of wisdom, well, they give us wisdom. E even, even, even wisdom can come from people that don't really seem to be Christians. I put this in conclusion under the heading of American fairy tales. You know, every culture has its own fairy tales. If you don't believe me, go to uh, the Barnes & Noble bookstore and they got a whole table full of Persian mythology and uh, English mythology and Celtic mythology and all kinds of them. But we have our own mythology in America. It's called Hollywood. Uh, there was an author. His name was William Sidney Porter. Does anybody know the other name for William Sidney Porter? Very famous guy. His name was O. Henry. He was a writer of short stories. Um, he wrote a collection of them. Uh, the first one was called The Cop and the Anthem. Uh, it's about a vagrant who, uh, what he does every year is he commits a petty crime and they throw him in jail and out of kindness they let him stay the winter in jail and they feed him. And the story goes that this poor guy can't get himself arrested. Every time he does something, uh, a miscreant, it turns out that he's done someone a favor or something. And, and, and he just can't get arrested. And so finally he sits down and he says, well, I'll do something good. Sure enough, they arrest him at the end of the story. Then there's one called The Clarion Call. And it's about a detective who knows a guy has murdered somebody, but he can't arrest the murderer because this murderer also knows about this detective's uh, debt that he has down at the, the horse track. And he owes the monsters down at the track. And the murderer knows that all he has to do is go and tell his detective's boss what the detective's been doing in his spare time, and the detective would be fired, and he couldn't arrest the murderer. Well, at the end of the story, the detective has to make a decision. Is he going to sacrifice his career and make sure the murderer gets in jail, or, or is he going to uh, um, protect his own um, you know, reputation and stuff? Um, finally, he reads in the newspaper that there's a reward being offered um, for the rest of this criminal. Uh, and the amount of the reward is exactly what this guy owes at the track. So he figures it out. He goes and he turns, he rests the murderer, turns him in and gets the reward from, from the newspaper and pays his debt and everybody's happy. See how old Henry does? The funniest one is called The Ransom of Red Chief. It's about this little kid who these two con men kidnap. The trouble is the kid is smarter than the crooks. And this kid is so much trouble. Uh, they sent a ransom note to the parents in the story. And finally they go to the house and they bang. Don't you want your kid back? And don't you want to pay the ransom? We'll, we'll, we'll cut the ransom in half. Because they're tired of this kid. And the Paul says, nope. Really not interested. And they said, well, how about you, ma'am? You're his mother. No, nope, no, nope, really not interested. And so they go back and, and, and uh, 
but by the time the one gets back from visiting the the parents the kid has tied the other guy up <laughs> and he's dressed up as an indian and he's whoa, 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 you know going around him and and threatening to burn so finally uh not only do they let the kid go but they give the parents some money to take him back <laughs> which i think is hilarious you say why did you tell us all those stories because life is full of wisdom that you need to learn. Uh, oh, Henry, he might have been a Christian. He married the daughter of a pastor named Smoot. He was the pastor of the Central Presbyterian Church in New York City in 1887. The trouble is that even though he married a preacher's daughter and went to church for a while, he got, he got in with the writer's crowd and they were a bunch of alcoholics and he started drinking. And old Henry didn't last long. He died a young man. He left a bunch of stories behind. And, and I read those stories. Uh, there's another one called The Last Leaf you ought to look up. It's a good story. And The Gift of the Magi. He seemed to have a real touch of godly wisdom about him, yet he couldn't manage his own life. Look, wisdom is no good. Even if you can manage other people, and you can tell them what to do, and it's the right thing to do. If you can't manage your own life, what good is it? And the maidens of wisdom are standing like the sandwich guy, sandwich sign guy, in front of the, the restaurant of wisdom, calling them the people to come in, come and dine. Come and dine. Come and dine. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the maidens of wisdom that they call us every day. And Lord, it's funny to joke about these stories that are made up. But even in everyday things like these stories that are not really about Christianity in any way, but, but some little wisdom that you gave somebody, we can learn from almost anything, God. When we're fixing the car or fixing supper or raking the leaves out in the yard or uh, mending a dress or fixing a tire or, um, you know, uh, painting, painting the doors in, in the house or, or laying new carpet. There's something that life can teach us that we can take and we can apply to our life and make us better Christians and better people for you. Make us better people, God. Please help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.